All right, let's make sure the screen is sharing this time. All right, here we go. Hello everyone, this is Danielle Robertson-Rath, also known as the Green-Eyed Guide. This is a re-recording or rebroadcast of the webinar, Preventing Burnout with the Five Levels of Fatigue. I wanted to re-record this to protect, protect the identity and the privacy of the people who did attend this webinar earlier today. So if you did attend that session, hopefully this recording um, is beneficial to you. If, and even if you didn't attend in person, hopefully there are um, some helpful tips in this session. So let's just dive right in. Okay, so before we get started, I would like you to imagine someone. Imagine a hardworking individual, someone who is a bit of a perfectionist, someone who hates disappointing other people, especially people that depend on them, and someone that has trouble asking for help. They, someone that would rather hunker down and make it work than admit that they're struggling or admit that they need help. Do you have a picture of this person in your head? Okay, great. If this person sounds like you or your spouse or someone you know, good news because this session is for you. What I've just described is me. It's something that I go through and it's why I do what I do. So let's talk about why we're here today. So let's dive into this fatigue. Let's talk about fatigue. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that yes, sleep is important. There are several books and TED Talks and blog posts, several resources that walk through all the different ways that sleep deprivation affects your physical and your mental health. And I'm not here to dispute that. I agree that getting good sleep is important. However, for some people, that's just not realistic, either due to their job or due to their current life situation. For example, when I was a college student, I had a difficult major. I was a biochemistry major, and I had not one, but two full-time jobs, sorry, two part-time jobs. And so there was a lot to balance and I was definitely not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. Um, nowadays, I'm the mom to a toddler and a newborn. So again, I'm not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. And it's just, it is the situation, you know, there's not much I can do about it for now. So even though sleep's important, there are certain situations where we just, we just have to deal with not getting enough sleep. Some of the occupations where not getting enough sleep is just part of the job or it's an inherent struggle in the job include night shift nurses and first responders, people that tend to work beyond the hours of nine to five. For them, getting enough sleep is an honest to goodness struggle. I think it's also important to acknowledge that fatigue isn't just prevented by getting more caffeine or getting more sleep. In other words, even someone who is fully rested or fully caffeinated can struggle with either boredom or mental overwhelm. And whether fatigue is boredom or burnout or somewhere in between, that fatigue hurts everyone. It hurts the individual, it hurts their team, it hurts the people that depend on them. All forms of fatigue, from boredom to burnout and everything in between, lead to mistakes, inefficiency, and impact our physical and our mental health. So what can we do about that? The plan for this session is first, we'll go over why the status quo isn't acceptable. In other words, why you should be doing something right now to address and try to correct your fatigue, try to manage your fatigue. Secondly, we'll talk about what not to do, specifically what caffeine and sleep pitfalls you can avoid. And finally, we'll talk about the baby steps that you can take right now, today, that will help you feel more energized, more alert, and less burned out. 
So even those baby steps can lead to big results. And we'll go through, that, uh, go through those in this session. All right. So let me introduce myself for those of you that haven't met me before. I'm Danielle Robertson Rath. I also go by the name Green Eyed Guide. I've been studying energy drinks for a very long time. As I like to say, two magical things happened in 2003. The first magical thing was that I started studying biochemistry in college. I am a huge science nerd, and it all really started in 2003 when I declared myself as a biochemistry major. The second magical thing that happened in 2003 was it was the beginning of the energy drink boom. So before 2003, we had Red Bull, we had maybe Jolt Cola, no dose pills. But in 2003, that's really when there was an explosion of drinks on the marketplace that called themselves energy drink, energy drinks. And it was the beginning of the trend of drinks that had more caffeine than your standard soda. So that's the energy drink boom. And that happened in 2003, which is basically when I started studying caffeine and energy drinks. From the very beginning, my goal was to use my science background to help people see these drinks the way I did through my green eyes, which is why I wrote my first book, Are You a Monster or a Rockstar? A Guide to Energy Drinks. So in this book, my goal was not to convince people to drink energy drinks or not to drink energy drinks. I wanted to help people make informed decisions. I wanted people to understand the truth about how caffeine and other ingredients affect us and what those ingredients are doing and how those ingredients work or don't work. So that was my first book. But eventually I realized that I can help people not just the caffeine drinkers, but also others that struggle with sleep deprivation and fatigue on a regular basis, which is why, why I wrote my second book, How to Get Shh Done When You Feel Like Shh. Okay, I'm trying not to curse, but that's, <laughs> that's, the, uh, the, that's the title of the book. So the title of the book, How to Get Shh Done When You Feel Like Shh. The Secrets to Caffeine, Motivation, and Productivity for the Sleep Deprived and Overwhelmed. And I know, I know, that's a very long, wordy title, but I learned from my first book that the title should be pretty clear what the book is about. So there you have it. So in this session, we only have 30 minutes today, but I'm going to give you some of the tips that are in my second book. So we don't have time to really dig into the nitty gritty details, but if you enjoy this session today, I encourage you to check out a copy of my new book because it'll have a lot more information for you to go through. As Green Eyed Guide, what I do is I help people who work beyond the hours of nine to five. I help people where caffeine consumption and fatigue or sleep deprivation are the norm. And through my workshops and training, I help these people manage their caffeine with healthier habits, and I help them learn how to manage their fatigue. You're never going to beat fatigue, but you can learn how to manage it so that you have less injuries for your employees and your employees have a better work-life balance. So that's what I do as Green Eyed Guide. And I love doing these presentations and these workshops. So I'm very happy to be able to do this virtual webinar for you today. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. So, uh, let's see. Let's talk about why the status quo needs to change. So at the end of the session, you might say, gee, Danielle, those were great tips. I just don't know if I can implement them right now. There's a lot going on with my life. There's a lot going on in the world. I just don't really have time to do any of this stuff that you're talking about. And hopefully I can change your mind over the course of this webinar. Let's talk about the cost of fatigue. Let's talk about the cost of doing nothing or why the status quo needs to change. So here's the statistic from Gallup, and this was a statistic before COVID-19. So these stats are probably different. They may be worse, they may be better. 
But before COVID-19, a poll done by Gallup says 67% of employees are sometimes, very often, or always burned out at work. And those employees, that 67%, are more likely to take a sick day, more likely to go to the emergency room, and more likely to quit. So what this statistic is telling us is that whatever it is we are doing now as individuals or as managers isn't working. It's not good enough if this many people, if, these, uh, if this percentage of employees feel this way on a regular basis. So this tells me that we need to change something, that doing something is better than nothing. You know, whatever we're doing now is not good enough. We are worth it. It's worth trying something because progress is better than perfection. So let's look at another statistic. Staying awake for more than 17 hours impacts your performance as much as one standard alcoholic drink. So again, in some occupations, this might not be avoidable. In some occupations, you have to work 17 hours in a row. And that's okay, that's fine. But if that's the case, what safeguards do you have in place to make sure that you or your employees are as safe at hour 17 as you are at hour one? Another way of looking at this is if you do work nine to five, but let's say you have other roles and responsibilities that you're juggling, whether it's a side business or your family, other things that you're committed to. If you're awake for 17 hours, how are you adjusting your schedule so that at hour 17, you are not doing something that's dangerous or complicated? Here's another statistic. If you're getting less than six hours of sleep, you're twice as likely to get injured as someone who has seven hours or more. And again, this might not be avoidable. Maybe you can't get seven hours of sleep because of your job or because of the situation in your life right now. And that's fine. But what can you do to minimize this risk of injury? So let's talk about what we can do. First things first, we can start by paying more attention to all forms of fatigue, boredom to burnout and everything in between. The key here is to see fatigue not as the enemy, but as a tool, because if you're paying attention to fatigue, to all forms of fatigue, you can start to see that as a signal for which there is a proportionate response. What I mean by that is, whether you're bored or burned out and stressed out, overwhelmed, you're going to have a different game plan, right? If you're bored, you might do things different to wake yourself up than if you were completely mentally overwhelmed, right? Each of those scenarios call for a different game plan, a different proportionate response. And as I've said before, small steps can have big results. It starts with paying attention to this fatigue, to all levels of fatigue. Let's start with what not to do. The impulse when people are tired is to have more caffeine. And I encourage you not to fall into this trap because it can backfire. For starters, if you're someone that works shift work, especially if you work the night shift, there's a trend among caffeinated beverages, not just energy drinks, but also coffees, to have a lot more caffeine in them per can than what we've seen before. So for example, there are some caffeinated beverages behind me that now have 300 milligrams of caffeine per can. This is a new trend that I'm seeing. And it's concerning to me because let's say you're someone that works the night shift. If you have one of these beverages, one of these really strong caffeinated beverages in the middle of your shift, it's more likely to interrupt your sleep. It's hard enough if you work night shift to sleep during the day. You don't want to add on to that struggle having so much caffeine in your system that it keeps you awake. So the key here is to not have more caffeine, 
but to have your caffeine more strategically. So let me show you this little curve that I like, this little, this little pattern, this little behavior called the Yerkes Dodson Law. I like to call it the Barks Doggy Law because I am a dog person. And if I'm feeling bored, if I'm feeling a little tired, if I see a cute little dog come by, whether it's on Instagram or in real life, it's so cute. It perks me up just a little bit. It breaks me out of that slump and gives me just a little bit more energy because it's so cute. It's a little bit of stimulation that helps me feel more alert and more focused. But if I was surrounded by 30 or 40 yapping dogs and they're all barking and they're all running around and making loud noises, that's no longer cute, okay? That's overwhelming. So there is a sweet spot where something that is a little bit of stimulation becomes too much. It becomes overstimulation and you actually perform worse. It's harder for you to focus because it's gone past that curve, past that sweet spot. This is something that researchers have seen time and time again with studies on sleep deprivation and caffeine with Air Force pilots, with military servicemen and women, and with truck drivers. They gave them caffeine, and those that had twice as much caffeine performed worse because they had so much caffeine, they were overstimulated, they were anxious, they, they were jittery. So the people that had less caffeine did better than the people that had more caffeine. Again, the key is to find that sweet spot, to find just enough caffeine where you're stimulated, but not overwhelmed and overstimulated. That's how you find that sweet spot. And the best way to do that is to nurse your caffeine. Like I said, there's a lot of caffeinated beverages now that have a lot of caffeine in them, stronger and stronger, more and more caffeine, that's the trend. If you nurse that beverage, if you sip it slowly, you're more likely to find that sweet spot where you're feeling good, you're just awake and alert enough, but not so awake and alert that you're hyper stimulated. That's how you find your sweet spot. Another pitfall to avoid with caffeine is the dichotomy between caffeine and naps. So I am 100% team caffeine. I would much rather have caffeine than a nap. And that's because oftentimes when I nap, I wake up and I feel more groggy than when I started. So what's the point of a nap if you wake up tired, right? So what this is called is sleep inertia. This is a real thing. So when people take naps, they wake up and it takes their brain just a little bit longer to really wake up. They become groggy and uh it's harder for them to focus because of something called sleep inertia. So basically your brain is still struggling to wake up. This is why naps can be dangerous or problematic if you're someone like a first responder and you go from sleeping to having to save someone's life in a very short amount of time. So what research, what researchers, what researchers have found works best in this scenario is to have a caffeine nap. And this is going to sound crazy, I know, but there's research to support it. So caffeine takes 20 minutes to kick in. And 20 minutes is the best length for a nap. So if you have a little bit of caffeine, like half of an energy drink or half a cup of coffee, a little bit of caffeine right before a 20-minute nap, you will wake up from your nap more alert and more energized than if you just had the caffeine or you just had the nap. So together, caffeine plus nap gives you better results than either of those things separately. It's weird, I know, but it works. You should try it. That's a caffeine nap. The third thing to avoid, the third pitfall when it comes to caffeine and sleep is the difference between caffeine tolerance and caffeine sensitivity. Our sensitivity doesn't change. That's based on our enzymes and our genes. If you are sensitive to caffeine, you will always be sensitive to caffeine. But what does change is your caffeine tolerance. As you drink more and more caffeine, you become more tolerant. So it takes more caffeine for you to feel awake and alert. This is bad, okay? We don't want this to happen because what ends up happening is you have so much caffeine to feel awake, you start 
hurting your body. You start hurting your brain because you have more caffeine than you should in one day. The caffeine adds up in your body. So essentially you get to a point where you're consuming so much caffeine, there's more side effects than benefits. So we want to avoid building a caffeine tolerance. And one of the best ways to do that is to nurse that caffeine so that you can find that sweet spot on that curve. Okay, let's talk about the other things that you can do. So the other things that you can do to feel more awake and alert and to beat burnout is an energy audit. So this is one of those easy things I said that will have big results. There's something called an energy audit, and I will email you this form so that you can use it. Essentially, it's a diary. So for 24 hours, you'll want to take notes for every hour that you're awake. What time is it? What is your energy level from one to 10? And what are you doing? So for every hour that you're awake for a 24 hour period, you're making notes. What time is it? What's your energy level? And what are you doing? And this is a very simple exercise, but it has huge benefits. Here's why it's so powerful. As a scientist, I treat this like collecting data, right? You're, you're doing a diary and it's basically like collecting da uh, data. With that data, with this diary, you can start to see patterns. And here's where all of the benefits come from. So if you're doing this energy audit, then, you can start to identify those patterns and you can identify the things in your life that you can control. You can identify places where you can make small changes for those big results. First of all, by looking at your diary, by looking at your energy audit, you can look at what activities do I do that give me more energy. For example, I love talking in front of people. I just get so much energy and I light up and I have so much passion for caffeine and fatigue and speaking to people about it. So if I want to have less caffeine in my life, I want to think about, okay, how can I do more of the thing that I enjoy? How can I do more of the thing that gives me that natural energy? On the flip side of that, how can you do less of the thing that zaps you of energy? So if talking to a certain person always drains your energy, how can you talk to them less? How can you, how can you spend less time talking to them, especially if they're draining all your energy? Or if there's a specific meeting that you have to go to every day or every week, and that meeting you always dread, and it always makes you so drained, right? What can you do? Maybe you can't avoid the meeting. Maybe you can't avoid the person that drains you of energy. But what can you do right before you interact with that person or right before you have that meeting to put you in a better mood or to make you feel more awake and alert? Maybe it's doing some push-ups. Maybe it's watching a funny video on YouTube. Maybe it's rearranging when you take lunch, whatever. There's some things that you can do so that when you're about to do the thing that drains you of energy, you're better prepared for it. These are the types of patterns, and this is the type of signal response that you can start to do based on your energy audit. We don't have time to really get into it now, but with my clients, I like to walk through this energy audit as well as the four different categories of interventions or solutions, things that you can do to give yourself more energy. So there's four different categories, four different interventions to your energy audit. There's physical, which includes sleep and diet and exercise. There's mental, which includes how you multitask, how you take breaks, um, mindfulness, things like that. There's the emotional, which includes how well or how much you feel supported by your boss, your peers, your spouse, etc. And then there's the spiritual. So for example, when people feel like they have meaning and they, ha they have purpose, they're less likely to feel burned out because they have that energy from that sense of purpose or the sense of meaning in the work that they're doing. So those are the four different themes or the four different strategies that I walk my clients through when we're trying to help them feel less burned out or feel more energized. Again, we don't have time to dig into this today, but there's a lot more information in my book. Okay, 
Normally, I would pause here for questions, but since this is a broadcast, there's no one here to ask questions. However, if you do have questions for me, I encourage you to get in contact with me through any social media channel you like best. I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook. You can email me any way you want to get a hold of me. I'm happy to help you. I'm happy to answer your questions. So let's move on to the toolbox. Here's your summary. Here's your takeaway tips. Things that you can start doing today to start feeling better, to start taking more control of your energy and feeling less burned out. First things first, stop doing nothing about fatigue. You should do something, even if it's just taking a moment to fill out that energy audit. All you have to do is write down the time, how you feel and what you're doing. Any small steps that you can do to start reflecting on how you're feeling, that mindfulness is going to lead to big changes. Secondly, you can avoid sleep inertia. So if you are someone that tends to nap or tends to drink caffeine, combining the caffeine and the nap together is better than just having the caffeine or just having the nap by itself. Third, choose multiple small doses of caffeine over the strong coffees or the strong energy drinks. I would recommend avoiding the energy drinks or the coffee beverages that have 300 milligrams of caffeine in them. A healthy adult only has 400 milligrams a day before the side effects start. So you want to, you want to avoid those really strong drinks, right? It's better to have smaller doses uh, throughout your day as opposed to one giant really caffeinated beverage. And finally, you can start identifying the patterns and start identifying the things that you can control by doing that energy audit. And again, I will happily email you the form. You can learn more about me and what I do and my workshops at fivelevelsoffatigue.com. So what else you can do today to start feeling better? Um, like I said, there's a lot more information in my new book, which is how to get shit done when you feel like shit. It's on Amazon. It's currently a bestseller, so I'm very proud. <laughs> but I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a really short book, but I've jam-packed a lot of different tips about caffeine and sleep and fatigue in there. So I encourage you to check that out. And secondly, right now, because of COVID-19, I'm running a reduced price. All of my workshops are heavily, heavily reduced. This is the lowest they're ever going to cost ever. So I encourage you to book a workshop with me before the end of June, which is when the workshops will, will go back up in price. You don't have to have your workshop. You don't have to schedule it in June, but I encourage you to at least book it with me before the prices go up at the end of the month. So in these workshops, in these fatigue workshops, what I do is I walk my clients through the four different interventions that we mentioned before, the, the uh, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. We'll also walk through the recognized best practices for fatigue management. And these are best practices identified by fatigue task forces in different industry occupations. So these are recognized best practices for fatigue management. And I walk my clients through that. We'll also do an assessment before and after training so you can see how much better you feel before versus after the training and the workshop. And finally, we'll go through some benchmarking. So how do you and your team compare when it comes to burnout and work-life balance versus other occupations? So all of that is part of my workshop. There's a lot more details at fivelevelsoffatigue.com. And if you feel so inclined, I would love to get a review. Let me know how, you know, how well you enjoyed this webinar and how well um, you enjoy my content. You can find me by going to Google Maps. Just type in Green Eyed Guide and you can find my business here. I've got some of the reviews um, that people have left me. Um, so I really appreciate all of that, all of that feedback, whether it's constructive or, or not. And once again, I would love to help you. I would love to chat with you and answer any of your questions. My email is info at greeneyedguide.com. My phone number is here on this slide. And you can learn more about me and what I do at fivelevelsoffatigue.com. I hope this was helpful. I hope we chat again real soon. In the meantime, take care.